Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. All right, let's look at Star Wars over here. Now remember, Paradise Lost, Milton's classic book, uh, these people get the wrong idea where there was war in heaven, Satan and a third of the angels lost, and then they fell on the earth, what, during the Genesis account. That's totally incorrect. You got to realize that this happens in the future revelation, and I already explained that. Now let's go to our text here. Verse 7, there was war in heaven. See, Star Wars, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. So there are these angels fighting each other. Michael leads one army. The dragon leads the other army. Now look at this, and prevail not. So notice Satan lost the battle. So this is where Michael finally gets involved, where he can actually be able to conquer Satan. Why? Because God's the one that gives him the power. But before then, Michael didn't dare. You'll notice that. <coughs> Excuse me. And prevail not, so they didn't win at verse 8. Neither was their place, look at this, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So notice that Satan and his beings, they lost their place where the stars are located. See that? So that's where where you hear the conspiracy stuff about UFOs flying throughout outer space and stuff like that, their place is no more over there. They're going to be kicked out. That's why it makes sense why there is demonic activity when you go throughout outer space. That's why it makes sense, as your pastor mentioned before, God had to put the firmament over there, and that's where he put the stars in the firmament, and also, the Bible shows that when he created that firmament, he didn't call it good. That's right. Why is that? Not only that, he divided the light from the darkness. Yeah. That's where all that darkness went. So, see, this makes a lot more sense when you believe in the Genesis Gap account yeah. and you believe in dispensationalism as you take a literal verse-by-verse -verse interpretation of the book of Revelation. <laughs> That's why your pastor makes a very big deal about right doctrine. Why? Because it all coincides together in some way. So that's why I don't take a gamble on that. I'm not the type of pastor that, oh, different doctrines, not really a big deal. No, I consider it a big deal because it can complement each other to give you greater truth on something. Now, obviously, your pastor teaches about respecting different people's convictions, and your pastor uh, realizes that you can't be nitpicky over every single doctrine and fight about the, how many toenails that the Antichrist has in the Bible. But I think that the problem with people is at the same time, they, don't, uh, they take that as an excuse not to see the importance of right doctrine. So I'll tell you what, I promise you this. If you take both sides and realize the importance of both sides where you don't have to be an extremist, but at the same time, you realize the importance of doctrine. Both of these so-called conflicting things will bring you, will force it into a middle line, a balanced perspective. See what I mean? Okay, so when you, when you take the importance of both sides, it forces that balanced perspective. So you have to do that. All right, anyway, let's go back to our main text. All right, verse 9. And the dra great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. So Satan got cast out of there, that old serpent. He's called the serpent. So we know in Genesis 3 who the serpent is. Amen. That's Satan. Yeah. Called the devil and what? Yeah. Satan. See, that's the devil. That's Satan. Which deceiveth the whole world. Yeah, no kidding. He, he deceives everybody in the world. He's a great deceiver. He was cast out into the earth. See that? From here down on the earth. This is obviously not at the heaven where God's throne is at, obviously. Why? Because sin is not allowed into the third heaven, Amen. and God has to separate uh, sinful stuff from heaven. Not only that, Revelation 12 told you it's where the stars are located. That's the part of heaven Satan is at. So there is no doubt that from this teaching that Satan and his minions, they're over at this location. They're at this location where the Bible calls the firmament or the second heaven. And they're now cast out into the earth. Now they're on the earth now. Okay, let's keep reading. And his angels were cast out with him. His fallen angels also fall down with him as well. 
So because the fallen angels also fall down with him, that's why these little green men from Mars, they're going to land on earth. Why? Because their place is found no more up there. Where the, the mythologies of Greek pagan gods, uh, and then they use these terms like Jupiter, Venus, and then you look at the book of Acts, these gods that came down uh, like men, and they mentioned Mercurius and Jupiter. What is all that? That's referring to these devils. Yeah. That's referring, if, if I'm going to be more specific, it's going to refer to these fallen angels over here. So because of that, their activity is no more located there. They go down on the earth. They go down on the earth. Uh, you'll also notice right over here that when they're cast down with Satan upon the earth, then that means this is going to be, ooh, can you picture that? At the tribulation, all of a sudden, uh, myriads of UFOs start falling down from the sky. Bam, 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 all over the world. And then uh, Satan just, let a huge dragon just pops out of nowhere and just lands on the ground. Dude, this, this tribulation timeline is going to be wow. <laughs> you don't know what kind of book you're holding in your hand. Yeah. It's uh, fascinating and amazing. Okay, now let's cover uh, this, the name of this dragon. So, some people make the mistake concerning about the identity of Leviathan, and they'll call it a dinosaur, but that's not really true. Look at the book of Isaiah. Look at the book of Isaiah, and then we'll look at chapter 27, verse 1. Chapter 27, verse 1. Now look how God calls the Leviathan here. And then I also want you to turn to the book of Job. Job, we're going to look at Behemoth as well. We're going to look at Behemoth. All right, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 27. And then we're going to look at the book of Job chapter 40. Job chapter 40. Now, a lot of people and creationists, they make this mistake where they think that Leviathan and Behemoth is referring to a dinosaur. That's not true. If you read your Bible, Behemoth and Leviathan is referring to Satan. As a matter of fact, uh, Satan worshipers and Satanists and people who get into the occult they know that behemoth and leviathan can be another name for Satan. So what Satan's trying to do is he's, he's covering his tracks again. Yeah. yeah, he's trying to make you think this is an innocent, nice creature in the, in the Bible. No, it's not an innocent, nice creature. Notice how God, what God does with this animal. Yeah. All right. Okay, if we compare Revelation 12, this is how you're going to prove this is Satan. You take these three passages. First is Revelation 12 first. Then you go to Isaiah 27 second. And then you do Job chapter 43rd. All right? Now watch how this works. Revelation 12 says that old serpent, the dragon, called the devil and Satan, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no doubt the serpent, the dragon, is referring to Satan. Yeah. Revelation 12. Yeah. Now look at Isaiah 27 verse 1. In that day, the Lord with this sword and great and strong sword shall punish who? Leviathan. Well, that's mean of God if that's an innocent, harmless creature. I mean, imagine your dog and God just suddenly punished it for no good reason, right? Oh, my pet dragon, my pet dinosaur, and God just went bam like that. Punish? No, there's no doubt this is a demonic creature. But keep reading. Leviathan the what? Piercing serpent. Revelation 12. Even Leviathan, that what? Crooked. crooked serpent. See, that ain't no innocent creature. It's a crooked, it's a crooked creature. So it matches up with Revelation 12, right? Serpent. And he shall slay the what? Dragon. Dragon. That is where? In the sea. See that? That ain't no innocent creature. So Leviathan, at Isaiah 27, is what? Satan. But God's punishing this creature with the sword, right? Now look at Job chapter 40. Job chapter 40. Uh, we'll look at Behemoth here, verse 15. Job chapter 40, verse 15. 
Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Uh, remember uh, the deep, deep doctrine about Lucifer having those uh, ox horns, you know? Interesting. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Some of you might go, what? Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. All right. Just take my word for it. All right. Anyways, verse 15, behemoth. How do we know this is Satan? Look at verse 19. He is the chief of the ways of God. Ooh, okay. Sounds like uh, Lucifer at Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. But keep reading. He that made him can make his what? Sword to approach unto him. He that made him. God made Satan, right? He made Lucifer perfect originally before he fell into sin. But what did he, uh, the verse says, he that made him can what? Make his sword to approach to him. Remember Isaiah 27? God will punish Leviathan with what? His sword. Amen. See that? So there's no doubt this behemoth is not some kind of dinosaur. Oh, I'm so sorry, okay? It's not some long-necked dinosaur. It's referring to Satan. Amen. All right, so scripture with scripture shows the clearness. All right, go back to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Thank God for creationists who study science and debunk evolution, but a lot of these people, they are not Bible believers or they study deep doctrine. So that's why they deny the Genesis gap. That's why they deny, <clears throat> that's why they have no idea that Leviathan and Behemoth, who they say, what a fascinating creature, wonderful creature God made. What a nice, per uh, what a nice animal. No, it's Satan. It's Satan. All right. Let's look back at Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. So John hears a loud voice that's about to say something up in heaven. What? Now is come salvation. So now there's salvation that can come out. We're rescued, we're saved, and strength. Now we receive the power, the strength, and the kingdom of our God. God's kingdom can be established now. Why? And the power of his Christ. So that's Jesus Christ. His power can reign. Why? For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. See, because Satan is no longer ruling over here. This is the start now of his rule receding. See that? That's why it says now is come. Why? Because where God starts his kingdom, this also starts for Satan in receding. That's why he has no place but earth now. And God's going to tell you, woe unto them that be on the earth. That's why it says now has come salvation, strength, and all that. See? All right, let's keep reading. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. See, it already defined for you why the kingdom now can start. It's being established. Because it's when he fell out of the second heaven where the stars are located. So God can take it over now. Which accuse them before our God day and night. Now that's a sermon that a lot of preachers use. So this is a great passage. Um, I guess we'll turn to these verses because uh, we could use a little bit of amens over here. So here's Satan. Didn't you know that there's a courtroom up in heaven? You might say, really? Yeah, look at uh, Hebrews 9.27 as it is appointed. See, you have an appointment, just like in court. You have an appointment unto men once to die, but after this the what? Judgment. Judgment. See, there's a courtroom. Another one is you have Satan. He's the what? Notice this verse says, accuser of our brethren. See, Satan accuses God's people, the brethren. He's cast down, which accused them before our God. How much? Dan, Dan you got to realize this. Satan has not stopped accusing you before God. Wow. But I thought that I'm eternally secured. Yeah, but Satan, he'll do whatever he can to keep accusing you so that he, you can get some kind of condemnation from God. That's why you got to realize you, you got to take spiritual warfare seriously. People are not aware of spiritual warfare. Demons are going around 24-7 tirelessly just to ruin your life. And you cannot survive without a day of prayer, watchfulness, abstaining from sin, and putting on the whole armor of God. Demonic warfare is real. Demonic attacks are real. Demon possession is real. And you got to realize, if you don't think it's real, you have not been paying attention to Satan's kingdom physically on this earth either. 
He's taken over the world. I mean, you see everything going on throughout our world. So you got to realize that this is Satan's activity. Day and night, he's the accuser. So he's the guy that accuses you at the courtroom before God, trying to find an accusation with you. But bless God, look at 1 John. Bless God, you have an advocate. See, like in court, you have an advocate, you have a defender, you have someone that can make you innocent before the judge. Thank you, Lord. Look at the book of 1 John. What a wonderful God we serve. Chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Look at this. While Satan's accusing you day and night, we have God's judgment over here. So God, his kingdom starts. He's the father. And then he has a judgment over here. See that? As he does it, with judgment, you have an advocate and a defender. Verse 1, My little children, these things write unto you that he sin not. And if any man sin, see, Satan accusing you day and night, right? Yeah. Oh, he slipped up in this sin. You saw that, Lord? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Thank Woo! Bless God. Man, praise the Lord. See, there is a courtroom going on. All right, let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. So that's what's going on. While this being is accusing you, the church, what, are they, what do they have? They've got the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ, because of that cross at Calvary where he shed his precious blood, he becomes that advocate. And if you look at 1 John chapter 1, the advocacy is not just on salvation. It is also even presently when you still live in sin. And 1 John 1 is currently to fellowship. The context is fellowship in your Christian walk. That if you sin and you confess, he is faithful and what? Just. See, just like a judge has to be just. Amen. Passing down judgment. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That blood of Jesus Christ not only uh, provided you salvation, but it also secures your fellowship and standing with him. That's why Satan is working tirelessly 24-7. Because if he can't get your soul in hell, he's going to get whatever's left over in your life. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. That's why we're rejoicing. See that? That's why we're rejoicing. Accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. Look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now notice that this group was able to conquer the dragon. So here's the tribulation, right? Notice that these group, these people in the tribulation, they're, over, they're able to overcome him. By what? The blood of the Lamb. And by the what? Word of their testimony. Okay, that's very important. Okay, word of testimony and blood of the Lamb. All right, so remember, you can't take one application when you read the book of Revelation. So some hyper-dispensationalist they might interpret Revelation chapter 12 and verse uh, 10 and rob you of your blessing. Christians can claim the promise of Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. You might say, why? Why can Christians claim that? Because there are Christian epistles that show that Jesus Christ is our mediator and our intercessor. That's, fall, that's found in Pauline epistles. You can find that in Romans chapter 8. 1 John chapter 1 and verse chapter 2, it may have tribulation application, but the context is Christians in fellowship with God. And that's something hyper-dispensationalists hate, and they keep trying to make that tribulation. 
That's why hyper-dispensationalists, they go so far as to say Christians don't have to confess their sins. So if you mess up in your sin, you don't have to confess your sin and repent. Are you mad? You're mad, man. It's a daily thing. We have to confess, repent. Why? Because if you don't do that, you're going to have an overriding of guilt. Yeah. And you're going to wonder, man, uh, what do I do with all this guilt? I feel bad about the stuff that I did. You need to repent of that. You need to confess it, obviously. You can't carry it around with you. So, um, anyways, Joseph Prince also teaches this heresy where he talks about where, uh, like the hyper-dispensationalist, because where Jesus Christ already paid for your sins, you don't have to confess it. Hey, man, confession is not just found as salvation. It's also fellowship. J the Apostle John said that many times in 1 John 1 that the context was not salvation, but your walk and your fellowship. Walk and fellowship. Okay, anyways, um, so remember, don't let these hyper-dispensationalists get to you where, yes, the context, we know it's in Revelation, so it's tribulation saints, but don't let that rob your blessing, okay?